incredibly excited that you all are here, and this is an incredible uh, new uh, departure for me. I, I've had to listen to uh, lectures on comparative religions for years, and I've, I've had my own thoughts about it. Uh, and, but as a dean, you don't really get the chance to teach comparative religions when you have a faculty member who's teaching comparative religions, but you get to watch things. And so this is going to take part, uh, what I'm going to hope to do in this class is do some of the things that I have always wanted to do if given the opportunity. And I, I, before I, you know, as I'm beginning, I want to identify uh, Troy Dostert, who's going to be also teaching several of these classes, who's at Cranbrook and has his PhD from Duke University in uh, political science, is that right? Uh, wrote a brilliant book on something called post-liberal thought or theology. Uh, and uh, also Manisha, Pastor Manisha is going to be offering a few classes as well as Pastor Joyce. So it's an exciting time to be here and I'm excited that you all are here. Um, so what I want to do today is just do a little bit of housekeeping and then we're just going to jump in. The, the text we're using is, uh, a, it's gone through several editions. It says second edition here, but when you go into the book, it actually makes it clear that this is the fourth edition. I'm not sure how those line up, uh, but it's a, a great book. Uh, and it's published by Fortress Press. And it brings together a group of scholars to talk about religion. And, and it's, it's really excellent. There are lovely pictures. Uh, it, it's something that is an accessible introduction and one that I think we're going to benefit from. And today, in this class, I'm going to go uh, through basically the first 20 pages. And my intent when I give um, at least the, the portions of the class that I am going to teach, I uh, like to kind of have a, um, uh, a wave that kind of goes with the body of the text but doesn't actually explain the text in a case-by-case a, a -case basis. And part of this is I know a little bit more than the textbook, which is really good for you. Um, that was a joke, but that was... <laughs> But I also uh, sometimes will depart from the way the textbook sees it. And so uh, I, I will actually flesh that out and give you uh, some, some examples of that. So, uh, but, but I do believe that the textbook is valid. I think it's, it's important. I think reading it would be beneficial to you. Uh, one of the things that I hope that you're going to get out of this class is that there are many different ways to look at the world's religions. And there are different models for approaching it and explaining it. And part of the job that you all have as uh, citizens, but also more importantly as people of faith, you all are obligated to uh, help uh, the world by sharing your knowledge with it. You have to be, in other words, civic educators in times of crisis, in times of misunderstanding, in times where we don't quite understand what's going on in the world around us, um, we have to be civic educators to our, our communities, uh, from the most intimate of those communities to the most public of those communities. So let me begin by asking a couple of questions just to get us started, because the topic of today is what is religion? What is religion? How would you know that you were seeing a religious person? Sally, you raised your hand. No, you're saying, no, I was pointing off the, somebody else was raising their hand. I was trying to be polite. Claire? Some core beliefs. So religions are core beliefs. How, what do others think? It's, so a kind of a saying grace at meal, so one of the ways in which you would know, and particularly, you know, certain denominations are, are good at saying grace and meals in public places, yes. right? I think that's one of the definitions of a Baptist, is they say grace at a public, in a public place. What other? A sign would be uh, garb. Garb, dress. Excellent. Sarah. Well. That is a beautiful question. What are we doing? What, what, is the, what, is the, what is the roots of the word religio? It, 
religio. Relig uh, I am excited that you asked that question because that was where I spent most of my preparation for this class. <laughs> Sarah, Sarah Allison, you have got an A for today. But you jumped way ahead of us. But anyways, it's good. It's good. I, it's, I feel like someone just opened up. My child has just opened up all the Christmas presents on the 23rd of December, right? Like, <laughs> ah! No surprise waiting for you. Um, Santa's disappointed. The, um, what is religion? Well, what the textbook offers this incredible definition that's meant to sum up all the different ways in which religion has been defined over the past 150 years. Because over the last 150 years, we've been aware that we are thinking about religion through our particular lenses. And so then people began to critique our understanding of religion. So some people would say that it was a matter of dress. Or some people would say it was a matter of piety. And some people would say it was a matter of, of other observances. Um, food is usually involved to, as a marker of religion. Uh, if you go deeper, water. Almost every world religion has a approach to water whether it be a ritual or a belief or, or some kind of um, way of thinking about it or treating water. Uh, buildings are designated religious by certain markers that are, or, or codes that we're meant to recognize. Uh, behaviors. So the textbook has put together this enormous thing and I'm going here to page one here on your lecture notes. And this is from, I think, page 20, if I remember it right, uh, by one of the authors. This is what it was defined as. Religion has to do with those beliefs, behaviors, and social institutions which have something to do with speculations on any and all of the following, colon, the origin, end, and significance of the universe, what happens after death, the existence and wishes of powerful non-human beings, such as spirits, ancestors, angels, demons, and gods, and the manner in which all these, all this shapes human behavior. So that's kind of a global definition. It's meant to kind of never be wrong because there were so many weasel words and qualifiers. It would almost be if it was written by a lawyer or something like that. But in fact, what I want to do is start to unpack what stands behind that definition, that global definition, because Whenever we use religion, and I don't want to jump ahead like Sarah Allison, brilliant that she is, the, um, but whenever we use religion, we usually are seeing things in terms and concepts that we have inherited, sometimes unthinkingly. We often talk about things in ways that have embedded within them power relationships. And finally, we often are unaware that when we talk about religion, and speak so definitively, there are other definitions of religion out there. And so I want to go way, way, way back. Um, I don't know if your kids watch Blue Cru Blue's Cru Clues, but way back, way back, it's something from, I guess that's out now because that guy went off the air years ago, and you all, if you're watching that, only have it by memory. So the etymology provided by the textbook says that the, uh, gives only the Christian understanding of religion, actually. And that was, as, uh, um, uh, was actually identified by Lactantius. Uh, there, there are his dates in the third century. In classical Latin, religio is related to religere, which means to reread, or legere, to gather. It was originally used by Romans like Cicero, who defined religio as cultus deorum, or the cultivation of the gods. By that, Cicero meant that what made a religion was, was these cults that would circulate around gods. And, and when you talk about a cult, I mean, the, the, the one way to look at it, according to Cicero, is that a cult cultivates the, 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 the shrine, but in a sense also cultivates the beliefs and the deity, right? So it's a cultivation of the gods, almost like a gardener. Thus, in his De Natura Deorum, on the nature of gods, written in 45 AD, he surveys the different philosophies and theologies of his day with a mind to showing how his own Stoic beliefs are more reasonable. So I pulled out a little piece from De Natura Deorum, 
And that's under, in there I jump all the way to page four to the text. And this is what Cicero writes. After surveying all the philosophies, theologies, all the cults in the Roman Empire, he writes the following. We, on the contrary, make blessedness of life depend upon an untroubled mind and exemption from all duties. Now that sounds like the way to go, doesn't it? Exemption for all duties. You know, blessedness of life, I got, you got me. Untroubled mind, I'll work on it. But exemption from all duties, that sounds like a rector to me. That's, that's just, that's the way it should be. What Cicero is operating with as he's reading all of these views, this kind of survey of the cults of Rome, is he's looking at it through his lens of, a, of, of, of his Stoic beliefs. He believes that the real essence of religion is this experience of apatheia, is the word for it, in which you are able to somehow stand apart from all the emotions that attack you and find, in the midst of all the changing world about you, the logos that elevates you and through which you participate in the world around you. So Cicero, pretending to be an impartial philosopher, standing apart from everything, speaking just as a kind of a scientist of religions, is actually embedding his understanding of religion with a value that his, from his own beliefs. So later it came to be seen, this idea of, of and I could say more about uh, what differentiates Cicero's, uh, the whole idea of, of religion in, 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 for Cicero uh, was not just a matter of, of the phenomena of, uh, or beliefs that you have, it's also a matter of laws. So there were different kinds of uh, cults and things like that, 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 um, that and, and rights that were categorized as, as private rights, and these were actually pivoted around property, uh, as well as um, public rights, which were mandated by the state. And finally, there are these rights that you inherited by being members of a, of a community, of a family, uh, inherited rights for a people, a, a, a gens. So later um, in the Middle Ages, skipping hugely, it became seen, religio became seen as basically a cognitive faith. In fact, it's interesting to note that one writer has noticed this, no one ever wrote uh, 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 or use the term religio, no one wrote, ever wrote a book on the religio in the Middle Ages. For them it was faith that was important. And so for reasons that I, are, are, are interesting, Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologiae defined religion as having two dimensions that echo the command to love God and love neighbor. And here I, I just pull from Aquinas, uh, this is from Summa Theologiae part three, um, uh, religion, this is going to text number two on page four, religion has two kinds of acts. Some of it are its proper and immediate acts which it elicits and by which man is directed to God alone, for instance, sacrifices, adoration, and the like. But it has other acts which it produces through the medium of the virtues which it commands, directing them to, honor, to the honor of God because the virtue which is concerned with the end commands the virtues which are concerned with the means. And by that, Thomas is trying to, in my opinion, and this is my Anglican kind of boiling down of, 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 of Thomas's Summa Theologia on this point, which we could spill a lot of ink on, but I, I actually think that operating in this is the double command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Thomas is kind of moving that through this idea of speculative and, and uh, propitiations and acts of, of praise to God, but also in cultivating virtues, the chief of which is charity. So that was how Thomas used it. Eric. Can you please explain the second sentence in Aquinas on page four? The, uh, where he says, um, other, I, yes, and, that's, and that's, that's the cultivation of virtues like charity or, or justice. What, I, what is the end and what are the means? That's a good question. That's the last part, and it can be a little bit confusing, but what, what, what he's trying to say is that um, there's an orientation of the being to God, and for Thomas, the ends uh, never justify the means, right? So the two are, are bound together. The means are actually the way in which you get to the end. And so the end is God, and the way you, you reach God through faith, if we think about it as a cognitive faith, 
is through loving God and loving your neighbor, or through making, worshiping, ador adoring God, experiencing the blessed life in contemplation and prayer, but also through cultivating the virtues. So that's how, and, it, and I didn't have time, I actually do have the Latin, uh, Latin in my um, home, <laughs> but I, I didn't have time to go parse it because I don't think it was the best translation, uh, but I can get that for you. The, um, it'll be fun. The, uh, before I give all those book away, books away, the first person actually to use the term religion in a title of a major work was John Calvin in his Institutes of the Christian Religion. Calvin used the term religion to differentiate between true religion and its opposite, which he considered to be basically folk fiction, folklore, and superstition, which for lack of a better word for Calvin would mean, you know, the Roman Catholic Church um, in all of its accoutrement, all the things it does, Calvin saw that as just basically superstition. And so he, um, text three, I've jumped in. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I just couldn't keep myself from giving it to you. Um, look at, the, um, look at the, the, the middle paragraph of that text. So Calvin is going on about why we have to trust the scriptures uh, over any kind of church uh, traditions, and this is what he writes, if true religion is to beam upon us, now remember Calvin was a lawyer and a humanist, so he actually knew how to construct a case. It is necessary to begin with heavenly teaching. It is impossible for any man to obtain even the minutest portion of right and sound doctrine without being a disciple of scripture. Hence the first step in true knowledge is taken when we reverently embrace the testimony which God has, pleased, has been pleased therein to give of himself. For not only does faith, full and perfect faith, but all correct knowledge of God originate in obedience. And, sur and surely in this respect, God has with singular providence provided for mankind in all ages. I don't know why I was capitalizing all that, but there you have it. So um, this was something that was taken up by people like Thomas Cramner in a, a homily that Cramner gave in uh, 1547. He said, more uh, straightforwardly than, uh, than Calvin, that uh, true religion is, uh, is the opposite of pap papistical superstitions and abuses. So there you have basically medieval and moder early modern or reform reformation views of religion. As we see again, religion is being deployed. It's sifting. It's, 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 there's an embedded view of things. There's a, a dichotomy. There usually is a true religion and a false religion. It's never without some kind of view. Jonathan. Well, I mean, that's, that's a huge and important question. Um, the question is that why, what, if, what would Calvin had say if you were using uh, the Koran? I mean, you have to keep in mind also, and not to go too far down this yet, but I mean, during that time, um, you, you have uh, uh, the, the, the Muslim world is actually impacting both of those writers and significantly. So Thomas Aquinas actually engaged in uh, apologetics with, with the Muslims, and he wrote a whole summa that s began to stand on its own called Summa Contra Gentiles, right? So, and it was there that um, Aquinas is trying to find some middle ground with, uh, with, with major Muslim thinkers about the, the larger orient and end of humanity. It's a beautiful piece of work, but it's interesting to note that for Thomas, you had to move away from the revealed scriptures and begin to think in terms of metaphysics. I don't have a problem with Aquinas, Calvin. For Calvin, it's basically a war of words, right? You would have one, one, reveal, one book of Revelation versus another book of Revelation. And my guess would be that Calvin would say, let's argue it out, let's preach it out. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure how Calvin, I don't have any knowledge, but I'm not sure if there is any knowledge about Calvin's thoughts about Muslims. That would be a great book for Westminster John Knox. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think nothing, you know, for Calvin, nothing rivals scripture. Why that? 
Well, that, I mean, I, I don't want to get too far into that today, but I, I, to give a short answer, what he, what, Cal, well, Cal, well, it, there is a, I mean, Calvin basically was a humanist. The humanists were animated by recovery of the original text. They didn't realize that when they recovered the original text and returned ad fontes, as the Latin, that they would be actually upsetting the papal hierarchy. And so initially, keep in mind that Calvin dedicates the, the Institutes of Christian Religion to the King of France. Because Calvin was French. He wasn't Swiss. He actually initially fled the Germany, and he thought it was the most horrible place he's ever seen. It was just disgusting. The food was awful. The only thing he found appealing about Germany was the wife he married. <laughs> and then he moved to Switzerland. They, they stayed married. So, I mean, he, he, they, they were all trying. And so the, this is, the scripture was huge in those days because they had not seen it in the vernacular. They had not seen it in all these things. And uh, so I, I think it's, I understand why he got excited. Um, you know, he wasn't, he had his, he had his faults, though. Um, by the end of the 19th century, religion came to be defined uh, as, uh, came to define individual beliefs that we hold only in the private sphere as beliefs that we cannot impose on others, living as we do in a secular society. This does not mean that religion was, um, I'm missing page three. I have it. Everybody just relax. <laughs> the religion was that, um, actually I'm missing page two. That's good. Yes, it was considered unimportant but that it had been categor categorized narrowly as one of many other social spheres. What I mean by that is you began to see these spheres that break out, and I'm skipping a huge amount of the Enlightenment for economy's sake, but you have religion being this separate institutional sphere in a society as opposed to, say, the economy or politics. And so religion began to generate its own place, but that didn't mean to that group of people that religion was unimportant. And so the example I used for this one was um, uh, Alfred North uh, Whitehead's uh, Religion in the Making, one of the most influential pieces of writing uh, that, we, um, that we have on, on, on religion in, in the early 20th century. And so Whitehead, and if you go to text four, which is on page five, uh, this is what, what, what Whitehead writes in 1926 in King's Chapel, which was a Unitarian uh, uh, church in Boston. Um, uh, religion is what the individual does with his own solitariness. It runs through st three stages if it evolves to its final satisfaction. It is the transition from God the void to God the enemy and from God the enemy to God the companion. Thus, religion is solitariness. And if you are never solitary, you are never religious. Collective enthusiasms, revivals, institutions, churches, rituals, Bibles, codes of behavior are the trappings of religion, its passing forms. So for Whitehead, he has this new idea of religion in which it is actually the core beliefs that we have. And these are universal, the, the, the symbols, the rituals, the practices, the narratives, all of those things, the institutions, all of those things pass away for Whitehead. It's just religion which is at the core an individual pursuit. Here again, I want to suggest to you that you might experience this as basically self-evident, but really this is Unitarianism. Alfred North Whitehead was a Unitarian. Of course he's going to say that in a sense. I mean, I'm not trying to, but, but I'm trying to convey a point that, that here again we have an inherited view of religion that is being imposed and is being presented as a kind of almost self-evident, clear, un unassailable fact. So skipping, you know, this review basically uh, makes clear the following points that I'll reiterate here. First, religion has often been understood in ways that reflect a given social and cultural context rather than uh, a self-contained, easily identifiable, universal entity. By that I mean that when you and I use the term religion, I would suggest that this historical progression casts a little bit of doubt upon the belief that we say, well, we're all the same underneath it all. 
that actually when we talk about religious experience, we are talking about something that has been shaped socially and culturally. Second, what I want to suggest is that this review uh, uh, demonstrates that operating in these definitions are embedded power relations. From the beginning, those who study religion tend to sit in a privileged position and pass judgment as to what qualifies as the true religious domain. So for Cicero, it's Stoic beliefs. For Whitehead, it's Unitarianism. For Calvin, it's the Reformation. For Aquinas, it's philosophy. God's philosophy, theology, really. Third, religion is defined by people who are usually unaware that they're offering one of many other possible definitions. So I want to consider two really powerful examples. And the first is from Christopher Columbus's journal, which he wrote in 1942. No, I mean, sorry, 1492. <laughs> Thank you, Garrick. I, no one brought me coffee. I'm going to just mention that. Oh. Think of all I have to struggle with. No, I, I drank enough coffee today to kill a small horse. Um, in 1492, he wrote uh, that the people he discovered in what is now the Dominican Republic, which we're about to hear a little more about, uh, have no religion. All the while, painting them with imagery drawn uh, uh, from the creation narratives in the Bible. So look at text... Five. And again, I hope you bring these home, read them in your leisure, particularly if you have trouble sleeping. So, this is what he wrote. I thought it a good idea to take some of the people from the river to convey them to your majesties so that they may learn our language and tell us what there is in their country and learn our customs and matters of the faith and interpret for our people when they return. For I see from my own observations that these people have no religion nor are they idolaters. They are gentle and do not know the meaning of evil, nor killing, nor taking prisoners. They have no weapons and are so timid that one of our men can frighten away a hundred of them just as a joke. They are ready to believe. They acknowledge that there is a God in heaven and are convinced that that is where we have come from and they are quick to recite any prayer we tell them to say and to make the sign of the cross. Sorry for the little typos there. Journey, journal entry from November 12th, 1492. So think about what he did there <laughs> on every level. But think of what the thing that I actually find haunting among, you know, the enslavement, the cultural genocide he's inviting, all these kinds of things, is these people have no religion. What didn't he see? Maybe the behavior, but he didn't see all the practices that were most likely there from what we can tell now. He didn't see ritual, but, but all of these things. So there was a long story. I don't know if this is true or not, but some people have argued that it took people a while when, for, the, for the indigenous peoples of America to actually be able to see the ships that Columbus sailed in on because they were just so outside their frame of reference. And I want to suggest maybe that kind of blinded approach was going the other way. <laughs> I actually think there was probably a lot of religion there. I just think Columbus didn't see it because his eyes had been used to a Western Christian viewpoint that was, uh, where religion was, was articles of faith, it was ritual practices, it was sacraments, it was architecture. He didn't see any churches. Much more recently, this is going to the second one, there is the discovery of the hominin species dubbed Homo nalendi, nalede, nale, well, you guys can pronounce it, nalidi, which was discovered when spelunkers came across a trove of bones in a remote underground chamber in the Rising Star Cave in South Africa. As many researchers note, the placement of the 1,200 bones, the number of skeletons found, the fact that there were no other animal bones found in the same location, particularly that of carnivores, no flora or fauna, no evidence of a mass fatality, no evidence of water transport, and no alternative routes into the cave, all suggest 
that this species practiced an early ritualistic practice of common burial, even though they very likely existed one million years ago and prior to the development of the species Homo sapiens. And so there I just give you a little piece from what I love about this whole story is the South African researchers publish all of their peer-reviewed articles on uh, open, open source. So you can look these up and I gave you the, the thing and this is what they wrote in their conclusion. Based on current evidence, our preferred explanation for the accumulation of the H. Nalidi fossils in the Denalidi chamber is a deliberate body disposal in which bodies of the individuals found in the cave would either have entered the chamber or were dropped through an entrance similar to, if not the same as, the one presently used to enter the Den uh, Denalidi chamber. So why is that significant? It all depends on how you define religion. Is religion at its core a kind of ritual practice? Does this fulfill some of the requirements? The fact that they buried their dead in one place, that they picked a place that wouldn't be attacked by uh, car other carnivores, that they didn't dismember the bones, that they didn't eat the dead, that they, um, that they protected the area. All of this suggests some complex behavior that I, as a uh, religious scholar, not just as a priest, I would call that a ritual. Um, but everybody is holding back on that because it's hard to actually call something a ritual because it would upset our whole understanding of how rituals came about. <laughs> because usually we talk about rituals as a sign of civilization, but this is a species that existed before ours. The Neanderthals had some rituals too, by the way as the book talks about. But this is actually an area that precedes and connects. So all of this is to say is that when we define religion, we have to be aware of all these things. And I think it's important to have this wider idea in place. So I'm going to keep pressing on. It's 9.34. I have, I have exactly 11 minutes, and I think it can actually get through what I would hope to get through which is having looked at some of the ways in which these definitions have formed over time, I want to look at some basic, very basic conceptions of what religion has been conceptualized as being, uh, basic approaches to religion. And so there are basically three that I uh, want to look at today. Um, one is, is, is that there are those who would say that religion is fundamentally um, an essence those that believe that the outward behaviors of religion are inspired by an inner life of faith or experience of the sacred, the holy. The essence of religion is appealed to when engaging in interreligious and ecumenical dialogues. And many of its adherents believe that this shared belief is a universal, that it's common to everybody, that we all have the same kind of orientation. So we see this, or we saw it in Whitehead's definition of religion. Religion is something you do in your solitariness. It's what's left when you take away all of the institutional, ritualistic, uh, dogmatic clutter. And that's what we need to get through. Um, uh, another person who did something uh, like this is um, uh, Rudolf Otto and the idea of the holy, um, in which he claims that all religious expression is an a priori, but that means, he means before anything else happened, uh, an a priori sense of the numinous or the holy. Um, there are also those who look at religion as a kind of functional place. And this is, by that I mean that there are those who believe that religious behavior and belonging are the result of social uh, psychological causes and that they serve social purposes. By that, to say a little bit more, it means that the purpose of religion is to convey kind of social identity or to create group cohesion, or to serve other ends uh, uh, that, that, would, that would hold together a society, or make it easy for us to incorporate ourselves in a society. And so the, there, there are three people, there some, some view this, this whole thing as somewhat negative, and that's, that would be uh, Karl Marx, who thought that religious beliefs were simply a way to uh, pacify, again, I'm looking for page four, is that, where am I going to be? Oh, that was four. 
Three. Oh, three. There we go. Thank you. The proletariat and to, and to remove their concerns to another atemporal plane. So I looked at text seven because it's one of the few places where you see um, him use the famous line, religion is the opiate of the people. Uh, and I give you the whole context because one of the things that Marx felt he had to do, and it's really kind of cool, is he had to dismantle the power that theology had in his time period. And what he, what, he, what he saw the problem of religion as being is not only did it kind of pacify the proletariat, but it had them take their concerns out of history and, didn't, and remove them to another sphere. And so the problem is that you, if, you, if you keep on doing that, no one's going to worry about the, the problems that they're facing now. And really, if you want to create political change, you have to get people to worry about their, their place now. Um, so the, um, uh, I, I, I'll read one piece of it, just the third paragraph down. Uh, religious suffering is at one and the same time the expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. So Marx is actually kind of, you know, I don't want to have sympathy for the devil, as Mick Jagger would say, but I think it was really, I, think it, I actually think there's a lot going on there that is interesting to think about. What do we do when we offer someone solace or comfort? Emile Durkheim, French sociologist, believed that all religious practices serve the purpose of maintaining social identity, which he often defined as the conscious collective. And so that I give you page eight. Now this is huge but it's the most interesting thing I've ever seen because there, this is from the Elementary Forms of Religious Life, which uh, Durkheim publishes in 1912. And in it, he actually says basically that religions are, uh, are, are typical for a church um, I, I, uh, and, and opposes it to magic. Uh, so I'll read that piece because it's fascinating. They're really, really, I won't read the whole thing. The really religious beliefs are always common to a determined group which makes profession of adhering to them and, the, and of practicing the rites connected with them. They are not merely received individually by all the members of this group. They are something belonging to the group. They make it its unity. The individuals which compose it uh, feel themselves united to each other by the simple fact that they have a common faith. A society whose members are united by that fact that they think in the same way in regard to the sacred world and its relations with the profane world, and by the fact that they translate these common ideas into common practices is what is called a church. Now, I want to suggest that Durkheim is actually saying something quite beautiful there on an operative level. I went to see somebody who is in the midst of battling stage four cancer, and he turned to me and he said, you know, this church has had ups and downs but it's always been a place of love. That was what he was saying about Christ Church Cranbrook. Ups and downs, but it's always been a place of love. What a remarkable thing. And for me, that was something that you hear as a pastor, certainly, but it also gives insight into how the benefit of building a common life together. So I think that some functionalists are helpful. And then there's Freud. You're all waiting, I know. I don't mind Freud. I think Freud is interesting. I think that, that one of the things that Freud is trying to do as, a, as, a, uh, as someone who is a, um, uh, is a functionalist is he wants to say that, that, that religion exists to kind of vent our antisocial anxieties in a productive way, um, but also he, he thinks that religion is broadly educative. Freud changed his mind about religion. So you have the, um, the future of an illusion in 1927, which is then followed in 1939 by Moses and monotheism. And so by the time Freud gets to the end of his own life, he begins to think about religion very differently. And so I've given a, a text from Moses and monotheism, but basically I can summarize it quickly because of the time I'm going to do that. He sees it as... Um, a way of, 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 of developing abstraction. That the, the prohibition against idolatry uh, in uh, ancient Judaism 
was actually an educative function because it allowed people to step away from their immediate desires and needs and to get to some place of critical distance. And so Freud sees that religion helps us do that. And I'll be honest with you, again, I think that that's a, a good natural thing to do. I think if, if, we, if we were going to point to a natural benefit of being religious, I think many people would say that that's what they get. So these are all people who are functionalists. And then finally you have uh, people who follow what the textbook calls a family resemblance model. And it's a model that I think is incredibly powerful. And that is that religious beliefs are like a language. They are, they are a social, cultural um, uh, grid that you understand the rules of, that structure your world, and that they resemble one another in a way that languages have cognates and have family resemblances. Um, this uh, initial insight was brought by uh, Wittgenstein and, uh, and it was uh, brought out a little bit by a, a, another uh, philosopher of religion called Ninian Smart, who argued that there were seven dimensions in uh, every religion or in many religions of uh, varying eff emphases. And so Smart uh, basically uh, identifies those seven, which is ritual, narrative, and, and mythic, experiential, emotional elements, social and institutional dimension, the ethical, legal, the doctrinal and philosophical level. So what is religion? <laughs> um, over the course of this class, we're going to be exploring this from multiple perspectives. And we're going to have, as much as we can, our minds blown a little bit. My, my interest in this is not that you would come away thinking what is right. My interest is that you come away thinking a little more deeply about what you're called to do when you are fulfilling your role as civic educators in the world around you. I can't imagine leaving people without some kind of parabolic sermonic closing just because I am a pastor. And so I'm going to say one thing. I'm going to read one piece from, uh, from Elie Wiesel in, uh, in, a, in a little piece that he did uh, for Gates in the, the Forest, which is 1966. Uh, tells the story to prove his point that God made man because he loves stories. When the great rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov saw misfortune threatening the Jews, it was his custom to go into a certain part of the forest to meditate. There he would light a fire and say a special prayer and the miracle would be accomplished and the misfortune averted. Later, when his disciple, the celebrated Megid of Mezrich, had occasion for the same reason to intercede with heaven, he would go to the same place in the forest and say, Master of the universe, listen, I do not know how to light the fire, but I am still able to say the prayer. And again, the miracle would be accomplished. Still later, Rabbi Moshe Lieb of Sasov in order to save his people once more, would go into the forest and say, I do not know how to light the fire. I do not know the prayer, but I know the place. And this must be sufficient. And it was sufficient. And the miracle was accomplished. Then it fell to Rabbi Israel of Ritzen to overcome misfortune. Sitting in his armchair, he, his head in his hands, he spoke to God, I am unable to light the fire, and I do not know the prayer. I can't even find the place in the forest. All I can do is ask you to redeem us, and this must be sufficient. And it was sufficient. Thank you. Thank you.